Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbert brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to this March 3rd, 2014 edition of Nightcast. We are broadcasting tonight again with the live stream button pushed, but friends, I think that our live streaming host is still having problems, and therefore, I think we're probably not on live, and so those of you sit, but we're handling the broadcast again tonight as if we were live, and those of you seeing it in the archive or on YouTube or on Facebook, um, you're seeing it the same as if we had done it live because we got the live button pushed and once we hit the button, we don't start over. We just keep going whether we uh, make a mistake or don't. And I just have to recover uh, because it's live on the air. We have to recover just as if we're live even if we're not live tonight. But we do have the recording to stream up to you. Now, friends, you, I'm opening tonight with an extremely important story, and most of you are probably sitting there saying, well, yeah, you're going to open up with a story from the Ukraine again. Well, if you look at this slide on the behind me, that is not Ukraine money. That is money from China. And we're opening with a story, even though we've got several very critical videos about the Ukraine tonight from today's news, and today's news is extremely potentially explosive between arguments between the superpowers, including the President of the United States and the President of Russia and the acting President of the Ukraine, and the ousted President of the Ukraine has spoken not only in a news conference Friday from Russia, but he's now issued a letter that the U.N. ambassador for Russia has presented before the U.N. You'll see this new story. I'll go ahead and tell you this much, where the ousted president of the Ukraine has asked Russia to come in to the Ukraine and go to bat for them there with their military powers. So all of that's on tap for tonight in tonight's news with video. Uh, but we're opening with this story on the Chinese Yuan. Yuan. It's also got another name. It's also, I'll tell you in a moment what it's also called, the Renminbi. Uh, and we're opening with this story tonight because, friends, today in today's news, this story shows how the Chinese Yuan, or Renminbi, is has a strong foothold for taking the place of the United States Yankee dollar as the world reserve currency. After being a closed currency for years, the Chinese yen has gone from being the 20th most traded currency to the 8th in just 12 months. The renmin, the renminbi, as it is also known. You should get used to that term because this money will soon rival the dollar or euro, and that's why the battle is on to see which European country will host it. Joe Lyman reports from one contender nation, Luxembourg. Thousands of dollars worth of renminbi or yuan being counted. Not in Beijing or Shanghai, but the tiny principality of Luxembourg. The hitherto hidden Chinese currency is going global. And Luxembourg wants to be its European hub. Don't be fooled by the quaint castles. Luxembourg is the richest country in Europe. Wealth built on the back of banking. It used to be the place where the French and German elite used to quietly hide their money. But nowadays, Luxembourg has the skilled staff, the ambition and crucially its place within the Eurozone to take on London in the battle for Chinese money overseas. And it's actively courting Chinese banks to set up here at conventions just like this so that in future big pension funds can invest directly in mainland China via Luxembourg. The Chinese have mentioned uh, the, the seamless 
uh, way of doing business that you can have in the single market as, as a key advantage. Three of the world's largest Chinese banks already have their European bases in Luxembourg. 35% of ICBC's profits already come from trades denominated in renminbi. Having been here for almost 16 years and we find Luxembourg offers very attractive legal and business framework with social and political stability. But London is already the financial centre in Europe. Why would the Chinese bank anywhere else? I think that there's a perception that there is lots of regulatory burden in UK compared to Luxembourg. If you think about London, a new global reserve currency is on its way, and many banking cities want a piece of the action. It won't be long before the renminbi will be tripping off the tongue as easily and as often as the dollar or euro. Joe Lynham, BBC News, Luxembourg. Friends, I wanted to start with that story tonight because that is extremely important. Because if the United States dollar is replaced by any currency as the world reserve currency, <laughs> what that means to the value of the United States dollar is uh, this direction, friends. And that's not a pleasant one for those of us who are from these United States. Uh, and it's going to have global impact, too, tremendous global impact. And, you know, we're, we'll, we'll hear from the economic experts as, as it happens, as to just how all that will play out. But I guarantee you it will not play out wonderfully for the United States at all. Now, there's one more story before we go to the stories on Ukraine. And as you can see on the screen behind me, there is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi, next to the United States President Obama. They met today in Washington. Yes, the Prime Minister of Israel flew over from Israel to the United States. Now, because of the bigness of the news in Ukraine, this has kind of like gotten backstage. But friends, this is big news because as a people or a country or anyone blesses Israel, so are they blessed. And as they curse Israel, so are they cursed. And I'll, have, I'll try to put a scripture up on the screen for us related to that tomorrow night, God willing. And the creek don't rise and we're here tomorrow night. But... Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Barack Obama last met in Washington. It was in September last year. And in this meeting today, President Barack Obama has warned Israel of international fallout, quote unquote, if Israel does not endorse a U.S. framework for a peace deal with the Palestinians. Ahead of talks at the White House, Mr. Obama told the Bloomberg News Agency that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu needed to, quote-unquote, seize the moment. But Mr. Netanyahu reacted def defiantly, vowing, I won't give in to pressure. And I think you can see those words on his face. In, the, in this still picture from today at the White House in the meeting between the two government leaders. There has been little sign of progress from the direct talks that resumed in July after a three-year hiatus. At the time, Washington said it sought to achieve a deal on a solution to the decades-old conflict. Now, that's the way the news puts it. <clears throat> but, friends, this is not a decades-old con conflict. This is a centuries, actually millennia years old conflict. But in our news story today, officials say a framework accord on core issues would enable negotiations to continue beyond April 29, which was the date that had, was last set for this. The BBC's Kim 
Chattis in Washington says Mr. Netanyahu wants Monday's talks to focus on Iran's controversial nuclear program. He believes the U.S. and other world powers are being naive in their negotiations with Tehran, and he is opposed to an agreement that could allow uranium enrichment to continue at low levels. But Mr. Obama is unlikely to budge and is planning to press the Israeli Prime Minister on peace with the Palestinians, the BBC correspondent adds. The U.S. President wants both sides to agree to the framework document not yet made public, proposed by his Secretary of State John Kerry, which seeks to achieve consensus on core issues. They include the borders between Israel and a future Palestinian state, the status of Jerusalem, Israel's insistence that it be recognized as a Jewish state, the Palestinians' demand that their refugees be allowed to return to their former homes in, in what is now Israel, and security arrangements in the West Bank with Israel wanting a long-term presence in the Jordan Valley, in the Jordan Valley. In an interview with Blom Bloomberg published on Sunday yesterday, Mr. Obama said he would warn Mr. Netanyahu that the window is closing for a peace deal. Well, you know what, without any peace deal, things have actually been on the back burner, and it would have perhaps been better if they'd been left that way, you know? Israel, uh, when things get a little too hot, Israel just sends in the military and, you know, uh, takes care of the problem. More from today's story, though. Quote, when I have a conversation with Bibi, Mr. Netanyahu, that's the essence of my conversation. If not now, when? And if not you, Mr. Prime Minister, then who? How does this get resolved? He said, paraphrasing the, the uh, revered Jewish sage Rabbi Hillel. If the peace talks failed and there was, quote, continued aggressive settlement construction, end quote, in the occupied West Bank, Mr. Obama warned Washington would have limited ability to protect Israel from, quote, unquote, international fallout, an apparent reference to the Palestinians' threat to pursue Israel at the International Criminal Court and a boycott campaign. Mr. Obama said Palestinian Authority President Mohammed Mahmoud Abbas, who will visit the White House on March 17, was, quote, sincere about his willingness to recognize Israel and its right to exist, to recognize Israel's legitimate security needs, to shun violence to resolve these issues in a diplomatic fashion that meets the concerns of the people of Israel. Now, Mr. Obama, let's go to the next slide we have on this. This is John Kerry and Mahmoud Abbas. Again, they're going to have a meeting in Washington on March 17, just 15, 14 days, two weeks from today. Mr. Obama said the negotiations brokered by John Kerry had been intense, detailed, and difficult. Now, um, this is a rare quality, not just within the Palestinian territories, but in the Middle East generally. For us not to seize that opportunity would be a mistake, end quote. When asked about Mr. Obama's comments upon his arrival in Washington yesterday evening, last night, Mr. Netanyahu told Israel's Channel 2 television in Israel, I will not give in, I won't give in to pressure. It has to be a good deal, 
I will stand up firmly for the vital interest of the state. He's talking about the state of Israel. He added, Israel's strategic affairs minister, meanwhile, told Israel's army radio, Netanyahu will, I think, give a clear answer. We are ready for peace. We want to advance a diplomatic accord, but we rightly worry about and fear for our national security. Israeli officials also blamed the lack of progress on Mr. Abba's refusal to agree to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. The Palestinians have recognized the state of Israel, but say recognizing its Jewish character would have implications for Palestinian refugees and Israeli Arabs. And friends, that's, that's the news report from today on Israel that kind of got shoved off onto the back pages, but I wanted to bring that to you and bring it to you early in tonight's news because that's critical. With the United States working against Israel as it really is, if, if you read between the lines and see it, you can see the United States is working against Israel, and that biblically will work against the United States because that's what God's Word says. You work against Israel, it works against you. You work for Israel, it works for you. So uh, we'll see in the days ahead how that falls out. Now let's go to the news on Ukraine. That, this is criti critical news today, and it is po potentially explosive with respect to or regard to the potential for superpowers clashing. Now, the just before we went on the air tonight, Russia's UN envoy, we have this video showing Russia's UN envoy, has said that ousted Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych asked Russia to use military force in Ukraine. In a speech at the UN, Vitaly Turkin said that Mr. Yanukovych had made the request in writing to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Madam President, today I, I am also authorized to say the following. The, the uh, president has received, of Russia has received the following from President Yanukovych, and I quote uh, the statements of the president of Ukraine. Uh, as a legitimately uh, elected representative, I say that the uh, events in my place and the events in Kiev uh, have resulted in the fact that uh, Ukraine is on the brink of a civil war. Uh, in the country, there is chaos and uh, anarchy. Uh, the life, the security, and the rights of people, uh, particularly in the southeast part in Crimea, are being threatened. So under the uh, influence of Western countries, there are open acts of terror and violence. Uh, people are being persecuted for language and political reasons. So in this regard, I would call on the president of Russia, Mr. Putin, uh, asking him to use the armed forces of the Russian Federation to establish legitimacy, peace, uh, law and order, stability, and defending the people of Ukraine. Viktor Yanukovych, 1st of March, 2014. So, colleagues, uh, I have an opportunity to show uh, all of you a photocopy of the original of this uh, statement of uh, the President of Ukraine. I show it uh, to the President of Russia, and there it is. Madam President, those who are trying to interpret this situation almost as aggression are threatening with all kinds of sanctions and boycotts. These are indeed our partners who consistently have encouraged political forces close to them to engage in ultimatums and to refrain from dialogue, to ignore the concerns of the south and the eastern part of Ukraine, and in the end, to polarize Ukrainian society. We call on them to show a responsible approach to set aside geopolitical calculations and to put uh, above all uh, the interests of the Ukrainian people. It's necessary to uh, fulfill obligations in the agreements dated 21st of February, including the beginning of a process of constitutional 
constitutional reform with participation and full consideration of the opinion of all regions of Ukraine for uh, subsequent approval uh, in a national referendum and also the establishment of legitimate governments of national unity considering the interests of all political forces and regions of the country. And friends, the boycott that he mentioned, I've got video that will show you exactly who is behind threatening boycotts. However, as the next story will show you, and I'm going to put that next, the, uh, it asks the question, as Bridget Kendall gives this report, what is Russia's Ukraine strategy? You're going to hear that Russia's military has given Ukrainian forces in Crimea until dawn tomorrow to surrender or face an assault. And this was reported to the BBC by Ukrainian defense sources. What is President Putin's strategy and why is he so intent on intervention? Diplomatic correspondent Bridget Kendall reports. What's in the mind of Vladimir Putin? How far will he go and what does Russia want? Tonight, at the United Nations, the Russian ambassador announced that Moscow's intervention in Crimea was entirely justified because Ukraine's ousted president, Viktor Yanukovych, had written to Mr. Putin asking him to send troops in. Chaos and anarchy reign in the country. People's lives, safety and rights, particularly in the southeast and in Crimea, are under threat. The first move came when masked gunmen seized Crimea's parliament, giving pro-Russian MPs a chance to vote in a new Crimean leader who instantly asked Moscow for help. More gunmen appeared at Crimea's airports at Sevastopol and Simferopol and the northern land crossing point with the rest of Ukraine. Then Russia's Black Sea fleet went into action. It's allowed up to 25,000 military personnel at its bases in Crimea Ukraine accused Moscow of violating agreements by adding 6,000 more and securing the whole peninsula with land and naval patrols. Latest reports suggest a further Russian build-up just across the border from Kerch. There's also that other fear that Russia might seize control of eastern Ukraine in cities such as Donetsk and Kharkiv, where most Russian speakers are, either by using pro-Russian locals or a military invasion. 150,000 Russian troops are on combat alert as part of military exercises across the border. Plenty of support for President Putin in Moscow yesterday, though there's a suggestion some of these people may have been specially bussed in. But many in Russia are genuinely alarmed at what they're being told, that an illegal government has seized power in Kiev linked to far-right and racist Ukrainian nationalists who need to be stopped at all costs. My biggest fear is that the Russian authorities believe their own propaganda and make fateful mistakes that might open the gates of hell. It's not clear what the West can do to deter Mr. Putin from going further, but maybe the economic impact at home will make him pause. Today, Russian shares plummeted and the ruble plunged to an all-time low, out of fear that the Kremlin really is prepared to go to war. Bridget Kendall, BBC News. Thank you, Bridget. The head of Russia's Black Sea Fleet set the deadline and threatened an attack across Crimea. The uh, ambassador, Ukraine's ambassador to the UN, I'm sorry, Ukraine's ambassador to the EU, called on the UK and America to take urgent action. And we'll have video in a moment seeing President Obama's uh, uh, threats for flexing his muscle to make threats of boycott. But here the ambassador to the, to the EU called on the UK and America to take urgent action not just words, not just threats of uh, uh, economic blocks, but urgent action with a view to stopping this escalation. You'll hear the ambassador say, we need to stop talking and need to act in a determined manner, he told the BBC. 
Yes, uh, first of all, uh, we need uh, Ukrainian forces need to show restraint. And by the way, for the time being, uh, we have managed to avoid uh, uh, direct confrontation and casualties, uh, not least uh, due to the uh, uh, restraint of the new Ukrainian government. This is number one. Number two, in my view, we need to avoid any kind of provocations because we are receiving uh, uh, information that Russia is preparing during this night uh, some provocation uh, by killing a couple of uh, Ukra uh, Russian armed uh, uh, forces personnel and to provoke a, a, a escalation of the situation on the ground. Another, we are receiving a new information about uh, Russia, a concentration of Russian troops uh, at the eastern uh, borders between Russia and Ukraine. I'm speaking about Donetsk and Lugansk region. And uh, in my view, the international community, and I call upon the uh, main guarantors of territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine, U U United Kingdom, U the United States of America, to take an urgent actions with the view to stop this uh, escalation of the situation and to stop this aggression. This is now, we need to stop talking, we need uh, to, to act, act resolutely uh, in a determined manner. And friends, this next video will show you how uh, pro-Russia's bid to capture the Ukraine Navy, the, UK, the Ukraine Navy chief, failed. Today, uh, this morning, uh, we uh, saw that uh, one of our checkpoints was uh, broke through about uh, 100 uh, Kuban Cossacks under the strong leadership and then they were and, and they were trying to capture our newly appointed commander of the navy Re admiral gaiduk uh, our officers stopped them they pushed them uh, we pushed them out and uh, and they left uh, the territory of uh, of our uh, base okay. well they tried to to break our lines of communication uh, to break our lines of supply and uh, to they uh, do a severe psychological pressure on our personnel to to betray at our motherland and to to make a sworn allegiance to a new Crimean government. These uh, pro-Russian forces or sometimes uh, Russian forces uh, they are threatening us by weapons, uh, but we don't uh, open fire. Uh, on them because we know that they provoke us and uh, we try to find a peaceful solution in every situation in order to save the lives uh, of uh, Ukrainian citizens. The general mood among our officers to stand for our motherland Ukraine. I think it's a great psychological provocation which is uh, aimed on a physical occupation of uh, Ukraine with a minimum uh, human losses. I would never believe that uh, Russia could start uh, aggression against Ukraine. The, the first our feeling after this aggression is that uh, first it's nonsense and then shock. I hope that all of this uh, hard political situation will be resolved by politics and that uh, we will not have any bloodshed. My friends, the Ukrainian Navy has been urged not to switch sides by its acting commander. Russia's military, let's repeat this so you really get the impact of what's on tap for tomorrow. Russians, Russia's military has given Ukrainian forces in Crimea until dawn tomorrow to surrender or face an assault, sources have said. Acting commander of the Ukrainian Navy, its Rear Admiral Sergei Gaiduk, has urged his men to stay loyal. Daniel Sanford reports. Heavily armed Russian troops standing brazenly outside the headquarters of the Ukrainian Navy. Inside, a critical meeting on which the Ukrainians' lives may depend. Their former commander tried to persuade them to switch sides but the new man, appointed yesterday, urged them not to. They decided to stay loyal and proved their loyalty by singing the Ukrainian national anthem. 
Afterwards, their admiral told me that his commander-in-chief is in Kiev, the acting Ukrainian president, Oleksandr Turchinov. I think uh, the uh, official uh, leader of Ukraine is uh, Turchinov. But he is worried. His men are hurriedly burning secret documents in the grounds of their headquarters. There are already four Russian soldiers in the base. Outside these headquarters are armed Russian soldiers, but here in the calm inside, the sailors are unarmed. And for now, their new commander says he is loyal to Kiev. At the Ukrainian military airport outside Sevastopol, Russian trucks were parked across the runway. Russian soldiers were patrolling. The Ukrainian Air Force were confined to the airport buildings. And one by one, Ukraine's army bases are being surrounded. Once more, we have found heavily armed Russian soldiers, but without insignia, guarding a Ukrainian military base, effectively keeping prisoner those soldiers inside who are still loyal to Kiev. Though trapped, the Ukrainians won't open fire for fear of provoking the Russians, but they remain defiant. They demanded that we hand all our weapons over into the control of Russia, but we refused. This still remains a military base. Across the border, Russia was reminding everyone of the extent of its firepower in the latest military exercises today. But it has denied Ukrainian claims that it's given them an ultimatum to leave their bases by tomorrow morning. Russia controls Crimea now, but no one knows what President Putin plans to do next. Daniel Sanford, BBC News, Sevastopol. And friends, if you've stayed with us so far, you can see that today's news is uh, on this situation in, U in the Ukraine is quite critical. And the President of the United States did speak today in uh, a seemingly muscle-flexing way, if I can get it down the right way there. Uh, U.S. President Obama says Russia is on the wrong side of history. What cannot be done is for Russia, with impunity, to uh, put its soldiers on the ground and uh, violate basic principles that uh, are recognized around the world. And uh, I think the strong condemnation that it's received from countries around the world indicates uh, the degree to which Russia's on the wrong side of history on this. Um, we are strongly supportive of uh, the interim Ukrainian government. Uh, John Kerry is going to be traveling to Kiev uh, to indicate uh, our support for the Ukrainian people, uh, to offer very specific and concrete uh, packages of economic aid, because one of the things we're concerned about is stabilizing the economy, even in the midst of uh, this crisis. Uh, and what we are also indicating to the Russians is that uh, if, in fact, they continue on the current trajectory that they're on, uh, that we are examining a whole series of steps, economic, diplomatic, that will isolate Russia. Okay, friends, we gave you as much volume as we could get out of that piece of video there. You may have, you may have had to turn up your volume a little because it was a little low. I realized that. Friends, as we Close up tonight, we're going to do an extended program just a little bit, just to be sure you're aware that there is other types of violence going on in the world. And as our chart from Revelation shows, let's put that on the screen for a moment, the second seal of the book of Revelation, of Revelation 6, is depicted by a red horse, which Jesus Christ describes in plain language as a horse having characteristics, attributes of war and rumors of war and nation against nation kingdom against kingdom world war with a looming round three of world war just ahead of us in the near future and the fourth seal being depicted in revelation as a pale horse which jesus christ described in plain language in the gospels in three different terms he described it in one 
instance as loimos, disease epidemics, the plagues of Egypt, pestilence, and another uh, sense or form of characteristic of this horse, he described it as seismus, seismic activity, commotions in the air such as gale force winds of all kinds, commotions on the ground such as earthquakes, and that's the term that was translated in the Gospels, but that term seismus, if you look it up in the English Greek lexicons, it means commotions in the air as well, gale force winds of all kinds, and commotions on the ground, and it gives an example of earthquakes, but that also includes volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, wildfires, floods, etc. And related to those things, we've got a few stories next in the news. Renewed anti-government protest on the streets of Caracas were occurring today. Venezuela's beaches in carnival mood. The president had extended the public holiday and many took advantage to relax. Not so the opposition. Thousands poured into the capital to protest at government mismanagement on many fronts, from the economy to law and order. This was their carnival, complete with masks. While the government doesn't control inflation, while we don't have food, while we have insecurity, while public transportation doesn't work, while the police continue mistreating us and killing us, we will continue protesting in the streets. The embattled president, Nicolas Maduro, has tried to dampen protest by promoting carnival, along with subsidized food at government-run markets. He accused the opposition of trying to spoil the holiday celebrations. I declare that the Venezuelan people have won. The Venezuelan people have won because happiness has won and defeated the opposition. Venezuela is at peace. Certainly wishful thinking as the almost nightly ritual began. Protesters hurling rocks at the National Guard who responded with tear gas. The government doesn't want to listen to us. They say they want dialogue, but they order the National Guards to throw tear gas canisters. Our country is facing serious issues. We need help from the international community. The U.S. is working on a mediation strategy for Venezuela, but for now, violent political confrontation appears entrenched. Emily Buchanan, BBC News. Thank you, Emily. And friends, there's more violence uh, around the world. Uh, from this weekend, more than 100 people have died following a weekend of bloodshed and violence in northeast Nigeria. It was a weekend of horror in northeastern Nigeria. Twin blasts hit a densely populated area in the city of Meduguri. The victims included guests at a wedding and a crowd watching a football match. A bomb exploded, and when we came out to help, another one exploded and several people died. After about 20 minutes, we picked up about 50 corpses. Enough is enough. We are ready to take up whatever we have in order to protect ourselves. We've called the security people, but they are unwilling to help us. Enough is enough. In the village of Maynok, witnesses say gunmen arrived, shooting at random, before setting buildings alight. Homes, businesses and their owners were all targeted. Meanwhile, this video is purported to show Boko Haram fighters reveling in their recent victories. They're eager to carry on their campaign to have Islamic rule in Nigeria, this at the cost of thousands of lives. A statement from Nigeria's defense spokesman says the military have registered the expected results in the ongoing campaign against terror adding that the mopping-up operation by ground forces after assault has confirmed the death of several terrorists located in the bases. These insurgent attacks are now a daily occurrence and they highlight the weaknesses in the government's strategy. Let's remember there's still a state of emergency in place in northeastern Nigeria. While the government claims it's achieving a lot in the war against Boko Haram, the people witnessing this bloodshed would say otherwise. Tomio Ladipo, BBC News, Lagos. And friends, those more than 100 people killed there. Let's take a look at our chart once again. Looking over at the fourth column where there's the pale green color and the number four that, that, that represents the fourth seal of Revelation. 
that Revelation depicts as a pale horse. I didn't tell you fully earlier. Some of you know it already. You've heard me say many times that this pale horse has a rider whose name is Death. And alongside that horse and its rider rides Hades, Hell, the Grave. And so this is a horse of death. And well, I didn't get to its fourth character, its third characteristic that Jesus Christ expounded in plain language as written up by Mark in chapter 13, verse 8 of Mark, where Christ called one of the attributes of this horse and its rider, tarake or tarake, meaning uh, troubled waters, and that means both literally and figuratively, and in the figurative sense, it means mobs and seditions, and all of that resulting in death, as the rider of this horse is named, death. And in another part of the world, uh, friends, the uh, there's, there was a bomb blast that killed three Bahrain policemen. And we only have a still picture on this, friends, so I'll have to tell you. Three policemen have been killed in a bomb explosion in Bahrain. And, ay, yeah, yeah, it looks like we're going to lose our... Uh, Looks like we're going to lose our uh, picture, perhaps. Ah, oh, no, it's still there for a little bit. Anyway, whoops, there it goes. Okay, well, I'll have to come back and just tell you about it. That bomb explosion in Baran killed three policemen, according to the Interior Ministry. A post on Twitter said the officers had been uh, dispersing rioters in the village of Day, west of the capital, at the time of the attack, and witnesses r reported hearing a blast during clashes between anti-government protesters and police who were firing tear gas and birdshot to disperse them. And friends, that's, we're gonna, that's it for tonight. We went a little extended because of uh, some of the important things and news involving Israel and the visit of the Prime Minister with the President of the United States in Washington t today. And because of the extremely explosive situation with a threat by Russia for the Ukraine forces to surrender by dawn tomorrow and other important news, including the one we opened with about China, now its money being an extreme threat to the United States Yankee dollar. This year, an extreme threat to pushing the United States dollar, the Yankee dollar, out of position as the world reserve currency. And that will have tremendous financial impact upon the money and the people of the United States. Thanks for joining me tonight, friends. God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again tomorrow night, Tuesday night, for our next edition of today's current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, this is your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, saying You so have been watching friends. Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.